Merry Christmas. Thanks for joining us for our uh, our Christmas online celebration. You know, tonight is my 43rd Christmas on earth. And I know that's kind of a weird way to start off a sermon, but I, I'm going somewhere with this, I promise. But I was born in March of 1980, and that's actually a unique time to be born. Those born in 1980 are sort of a transitional generation. We have things in common with people in Gen X, which is usually defined as those born from 1965 to the early 80s, but we also identify with millennials, which range from 1981 to 1996. And I've always felt this tension. Like even now, I, I feel like I'm a little bit old school, but also not. Like I like old school stuff, but sometimes I need something fresh. And when it comes to how I watch movies, I am definitely 
old school. You know, when I watch movies, I like silence. Like I'm closely paying attention to the details because otherwise I'm not going to understand what's going on. That's that's kind of old school because because I don't know if you know, but these new cats, these young folks, folks, uh, they have full on conversations during movies. You all know what I'm talking about? Like they're trying to figure out the plot and they're commenting on the, the movie soundtrack and remembering how this scene reminds them of another movie. And I'm like, shh, quiet. I'm trying to I'm trying to watch the movie. And then they'll have the nerve to ask, hey, wait, what's what's going on here? What did I miss? Why did this, why did this happen? And I'm like, you know, if, if you would have been paying attention instead of talking, you know, because that, that's how a movie works. Like the director is telling a story. And when you pay attention, you can follow that story. And then you understand why things are happening. Like, I, I can't get down with the way that this younger generation watches movies. By the way, I'm not making a statement on whether or not one way is right or wrong. I know each generation has their own way of doing things, and that's perfectly fine. But I, I mention this because for those of you who weren't here last week, we are in the middle of a two-part Christmas message titled The Unexpected Gift. And last week was part one, and today is part two, and both parts are necessary for accomplishing my purpose behind this message, which is to understand the greater meaning of Christmas. And so tonight, I'm going to start by reviewing last week. That way, some of us, those of us who weren't with us last week, we don't feel like we've started watching a movie halfway through and we're not asking, hey, wait, what's going on here? Uh, And so last week, we focused our time around this somewhat harsh truth statement. I said that none of us deserve anything for Christmas. Now, some of us may have difficulty uh, immediately receiving this truth. I know we did last week. It's it's common for most of us to, to think of ourselves as good people. You know, we know we're not perfect, but if it came down to whether we believe we were on Santa's naughty or nice list, we'd probably be on the nice list. And if we're on Santa's nice list, then we're probably on God's good list too. But God's word says differently. In Ephesians 2, it says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of of mankind. In other words, you deserve nothing. I deserve nothing. We deserve nothing. Everyone is on God's naughty list. And to prove this, we did a little group test. And so how many of you have heard of the Ten Commandments? I'm assuming most of you, but they are part of God's law and they are a helpful tool for us to see if we're on the naughty or nice list. For example, Exodus 20, 16 says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Now, wherever you are watching this, at home, maybe in the car, by a show of hands, how many of you have ever told a lie? Now, if you are not raising your hand, you are lying. How about this one? The sixth commandment says, you shall not murder. Now, most of you are probably like, ha, I'm good at that one. Honestly, I hope all of you are saying that. But look at what Jesus says. He says in Matthew chapter 5, you have heard that it was said of those by, by those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. Somebody say, oh snap. Yeah, we're all in trouble with that one. Now this one is for any of the kids who are listening right now, although I'm sure it's applicable to all of us. The fifth commandment says, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. How many of us have broke that commandment? And so how are we doing on the good person test? That's only three out of the 10 commandments. Are you starting to get why I say none of us deserve anything for Christmas? The bad news is that none of us are good. Truthfully, we're not on Santa's nice list, and we especially aren't on God's good person list. 
But before you turn this off or you walk away because this is not the Christmas message that you were expecting, let me share something from you from the very first Christmas. In the book of Luke, we find Joseph and Mary, his fiance, they're traveling to the city of Bethlehem and the Virgin Mary is miraculously pregnant. And when they arrive, Mary starts to give birth, but there was nowhere for them to stay because everybody and their mama was up in this place. So she gives birth in a manger. And that's when Luke writes, and in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. It is very likely that the main reason the shepherds were afraid was because they were bad dudes. That That's because at this time, shepherding was kind of like a scumbag job. These guys likely had a past and being a dirty shepherd was the only job they could get. Therefore, when they saw the angel of the Lord appear, they were afraid because they probably thought, hey, I'm a bad dude. I know what I've done in the past. And now the angel of the Lord is here to execute God's judgment on my life. I'm dead. And so they were greatly afraid. And I mention this because here in the original Christmas story, the very first Christmas, we find bad news. Bad news is part of the Christmas story. And it's important for us to see this so that we can properly understand the greater, the original meaning of Christmas. But now for some good news. You know, the beauty of the Christmas message, the beauty of the message of the Bible, the beauty of the gospel, the beauty of our Christian faith is that it does not stop at the bad news. It doesn't hide the bad news. It doesn't ignore the bad news, but it does not stop at the bad news because look at what the angels said to the lowly shepherds next. He says, fear not for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. And in the book of Ephesians, after Paul wrote about how bad we are, look at what's next. It says in verse four, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. You know, the greater meaning of Christmas requires that we first understand the bad news because the bad news makes the good news truly good. And that's what part two of this message is about. Though no one deserves anything for Christmas, on the very first Christmas, God gave us everything anyways. The angel tells the shepherd, here's the good news of great joy that will be for all people, that although all of us are sinners deserving God's judgment for unto us is born on this day in the city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord. The good news of Christmas is God gave us an unexpected and undeserved gift. He gave us his son, Jesus, who would save us from our sins. And to better understand this, let's jump back into Ephesians 2. So again, starting in verse 1, it says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. In other words, you're following the devil, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind, and we're by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind, meaning we all deserve God's judgment. That's the bad news. But here's the good news. Ephesians 2, 4 says, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. By nature, we are all evil. By nature, we deserve God's judgment. But God, and I love that, we don't deserve anything except for judgment for Christmas. But God has a different plan. And this plan is based on two truths. First off, God has a different plan because it says that he is rich in mercy. Remember that old Disney Christmas movie, Mickey's Christmas Carol with Scrooge McDuck? You know, Scrooge McDuck was also part of another Disney show called DuckTales. 
And Uncle Scrooge was so rich that he had a huge vault filled with gold that he used to dive into and then swim in it. And that's kind of the picture the Apostle Paul paints when he writes that God is rich in mercy. God is so rich with mercy that he could swim in it like Uncle Scrooge did with his money. And the word mercy means to have a desire and ability to save. And both desire and ability are important, right? Because you can have a desire, but no ability to save, or you can have the ability to save, but have no desire. But our salvation requires both, and God is rich with both. Somebody say, that's, that's, that's good news. But here's the second thing. Again, look at verse four. It says, we deserve nothing from God, but God is so rich in mercy towards us because, and look at this beautiful truth, because of the great love with which he loved us. The word for love that's used here is the Greek word agape. And it's not a shallow love. It's not a temporary love. It's not a love that can be impacted by circumstances. It doesn't change based on our ever-shifting emotions. It is God's perfect, everlasting love. And notice how it also says, with which he loved us. Do you see how it's written in the past tense? Now, that doesn't mean that God used to love us. It means that God has always loved us. Let that sink into your heart. It means that before God created anything, he knew you and he loved you. Before you had a chance to do anything right or wrong, he has loved you. He has always loved you. And some of us need to hear that today. And that's why he gave us the greatest gift on that first Christmas. That's why he gave us Jesus as a savior, even though we don't deserve it. He gave us an unexpected gift because he loves us. Just as many of us will give Christmas gifts to people, not because they deserve it, but because we love them. Now, Paul goes on to write, even when we were dead in our trespasses, even when we deserved nothing but judgment, God made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, an unexpected, undeserved gift, not a result of works so that no one may boast. God gave us his son, Jesus, as an unexpected, undeserved gift on that first Christmas. And the reason that he did, again, is because he loved us. He's always had a desire to save us from our sins. And he alone had the ability to save us, to live that perfect life that we could never live, that was required so that he could sacrifice that life on the cross so that we could be forgiven. And that's the Christmas gift that we find when we unwrap that gift. It was the exchange of all our sinful life for his perfect life. He suffered and died the death that we deserved. So in exchange, we could live the life that we don't deserve, an eternal life in the presence of God's perfect love. And the only thing that we need to do is receive it. In the same way that we're going to receive gifts in a couple of days. We don't earn it. We don't pay the person who's giving the gift to us. That's what Paul means when he says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift, not a result of work so that no one may boast. All you need to do is believe and receive. But here's what's crazy. Look at this unbelievable goodness that is found in verse 7. It says, So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Remember, God's rich. 
You know, I love my sons and my love language is gift giving. Like I show love to by, by giving people gifts. And Christmas time, it's dangerous for me because I want to keep going out and keep shopping so that I can buy more gifts for my sons so I can show them my love. But I can't because I ain't rich. But God is rich. And verse seven is a beautiful gift giving promise. It's a promise that God's not done giving us gifts. Yes, the greatest gift is the salvation found in Jesus Christ. It's more than we deserve and it's all that we really need. But God always goes above and beyond. He's like some of y'all grandparents at Christmas time. Some of y'all grandparents don't lost your mind. Y'all used to give us, your kids, pencils and socks, but you're spoiling your grandkids, getting them Jordan 1s and and giving them $100 bills. But that's okay. That's okay. Because you know what? What you're really doing is showing them God's love. Because in verse 7, God's telling us, I ain't done giving presents yet. I love you so much that for all of eternity, I can't wait. I plan on showering you with more gifts and more gifts and more gifts, even though you don't deserve them. Somebody say, that's good news. And all of this is part of the greater meaning of Christmas. Christmas involves understanding the bad news that none of us deserve anything. From birth, we're all sinners doomed for God's holy judgment. No one is good. Everyone's on the naughty list, but God, who is rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, sent Jesus on that first Christmas as a gift, a savior that we desperately needed. And that's the great news of great joy for all people. Even for us today, 2,000 years later, on the other side of the planet from where this originally happened. But before we end, let's finish Luke's story, uh, uh, Luke's version of the Christmas story. So the angel of the Lord said, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. But then he continues and says, And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And And then he goes on in verse 15 and says, And when the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told told us about. And and they hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in the manger. And after seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. Here's where I read this. Notice the accessibility to the Savior. This is the eternal Son of God, the Lord of all creation, the King of the universe. You'd think that only special people could come into his presence. And yet we see here in the story, dirty, possibly shady shepherds were sitting with him. And in Matthew's version of the Christmas story, we read that kings or wise men, people with influence from the East, they came and they visited him too. And why is that important? Because regardless of whether we are rich or poor, educated or not, powerful or in prison, we are all sinners in need of a savior. But more importantly, we all have access to him. Jesus is truly good news of great joy for all people. And so as we close, let me ask you, do you need to receive God's gift of salvation tonight? Do you need to get right with God? If so, all you need to do is believe and receive. Believe the truth about the bad news, that we're sinners who deserve nothing but judgment. But don't stop there. Remember the good news too, that God loves us so much that he gave Jesus, the Savior, to us as a gift. And if we will turn from our sins and put our faith in Jesus as Savior, if we will believe that he lived a perfect life and and then sacrificed that life on the cross to pay for our sins, God promises that we will be forgiven. We will be made right with him. And then we will have the promise of heaven. We will spend eternity in God's perfect love. 
So again, do you need to get right with God today? Maybe some of you are hesitant to receive from God right now. Maybe you don't think you belong in God's presence or with God in heaven. Like, like you're watching church or listening to church online right now, but you usually stay away from church because you got a past. You're ashamed and broken and afraid. But remember, the good news of Christmas is that no matter what you've done or who you are, this gift is truly for you. Whether you're a shepherd, a king, or anything in between, you can receive the salvation you need from Jesus tonight. All you got to do is believe and receive. And so right now, I'm going to pray, and I'd like for all of us to have a special opportunity to respond to God. And so if you would just join me in prayer right now, let this be a private and, and, and special moment for those who need it. If for some reason you're listening to this in the car, hey, maybe you know that you need to get right with God right now. And so you need to find a place to pull over so that you could have this moment with God. I, in fact, I believe that there are people listening right now, people watching right now who, who are having this moment. And this is a moment that God has planned before creation. And so wherever we're at right now, joining in on this Christmas service, online or over podcast or whatever, and we're celebrating, we're remembering the birth of Jesus, I believe that God is present with you, with us right now. He's the God who has always loved us, and he's always loved you. And tonight, he has an unexpected gift, an undeserved gift for you. And all you got to do is receive it. And so a- as we pray, if you would like to receive this gift right now, would you just kind of raise your hand wherever you're at? Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. This is a moment between you and God. No one can see you. And even if they could, who cares? Right now you're getting right with God. And that's the only thing that matters. And as we pray together, let's let's pray this. God, we've come here tonight to be with you. We've logged online. We're listening in on the podcast, whatever. We've come to be with you because we need you. We've messed up. We've sinned. and, And many of us have even forgotten what Christmas is all about. And for that, we ask your forgiveness. We know we don't deserve it, but because you love us, we can be confident to ask for it. And so tonight, we receive the gift that you have for us. Maybe that's forgiveness and salvation because we've placed our faith in Jesus for the first time. Or maybe it's a supernatural healing for our broken hearts. And maybe it's some other transforming work that your Holy Spirit is doing inside of us right now and and, and healing our souls. Whatever it is, we say thank you. We say have your way. Thank you for bringing us here and giving us this unexpected gift. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us for Church Online. If this was your first time joining us, please fill out a Connect card. We would love to say hi to you, even send you a gift. Also, if you have any prayer requests, would like to know more about the River Church, or if you have decided to follow Jesus today, we want to hear from you, and there's an easy way to do that on our website, riverchurchct.com, or you can follow the links in the comments below if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, or you can connect with us by texting us the keyword TRC Connect to 94,000. Merry Christmas, everyone. Have a great day.